Good afternoon, church family. This is Tad once more, and uh, I'm just glad to be uh, here with you today and to be uh, studying over the Holy Week. Uh, today we're on Monday, and uh, wow, uh, what an exciting day uh, Monday is, and we're just excited to be here, and we're uh, just, man, I'm just ready to to dive into God's Word uh, with you. So so let's just go ahead and kick it off. You know, uh, whenever we think about uh, Holy Monday or the, the second day of the Holy Week uh, after Palm Sunday, of course, uh, what, what comes to mind is going to be... Uh, uh, an event that's known as the Temple Cleansing, all right? And so in order for us to kind of get an idea of about the Temple Cleansing and why that matters and why it's important, I think we, we probably need to take a step back and just look a little bit at the Temple uh, in itself, in general, before, before, the, um, before the cleansing happened, right? So, so, so just imagine, if you, will, uh, if you will, with me for just a moment of, of the Temple, right? The Holy Temple that, that's designed by God and is, is given to the Hebrew people and is ultimately built by Solomon. Uh, it, it is essentially kind of laid out in layers, right? And, and so starting from the, from the outside, uh, what you have in these layers is this outermost court uh, that's known as the Court of the Gentiles, right? And the Court of the Gentiles where anyone of any ethnicity, any, any place in the world could come and they could pray and they could all offer up their prayers to, to the one true uh, living God. Now also, right, as, as you take a step in there, then you go into what's called the Outer Court, or is known as the, the court of the women, right? So if you were a Hebrew woman, then you didn't have to stop, right, at the court of the Gentiles. You could go inside the gates of the temple, and while in that court of the women, right, the outer court, then you could go in there, and you could make prayers, right, and you could pray, and you could worship the Lord there. Now, from there, there there's an inner court, right? You step through another set of gates, and there's an inner court where if you were a Hebrew man, then, then you could go through the court of the Gentiles, you could go through the court of the women, and then into the inner court. Right, and while you're in the inner courts, the priests will take your sacrifice, right, and they'll be doing the sacrificing, and and you can be in the inner courts, right, and, and you can be there, and you can be worshiping and praising the Lord as well. Now, after the inner court, you, you have the holiest places, right? You have the holy place, and in the holy place is where the altar is, right? You go in, and it's where the sacrifices are made, it's where the uh, the incense are burned, right, to the Lord. And then in the original temple, in Solomon's temple, right, once you go in from there, there's another room that housed the ark of the covenant. Now, uh, after the exile, after the Hebrews were able to come back to their homeland, right, they, they rebuilt the temple with, with these dimensions and with these kind of different courts, but the holiest of holies, right, that inner, inner, inner court, right, remained empty because they no longer had the Ark of the Covenant, all right? So, so now that we kind of see how, how the temple works, how it stacks up, Gentiles, women, men, priests, and then the Ark of the Covenant, right, where God resides within the mercy seat, um, so now that we have that, let's just kind of go back and look a little bit more at the dedication of the temple, right? Solomon was the one who, who God used to build the temple. And so after he builds it in 1 Kings chapter 8, uh, he says a prayer of dedication. And specifically what I'd like for us to look at today in this prayer is going to be in chapter 8, verses uh, 41 through 43. And I'll read those for you right now. It says, Even for the foreigner who is not of your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your name, for they will hear of your great name, strong hand, and outstretched arm, and will come and pray toward this temple. May you hear in heaven your dwelling place, and do according to all the, all the foreigner ask, then all the people of earth will know your name, to fear you as your people Israel do, and to know that this temple I have built bears your name. Now, see, one of the purposes of the temple was to stand as a testament and as a light that shone not only to the Hebrew people, not only to the Israelites, but also it was to shine to all the nations so that people from all over the world could come to this temple and that they could know the Lord, right? That they could come to this temple, that they could know him and they could fear him and they could follow him, right? So the temple is more than just a center of, of sacrificial worship for the Jewish and the Hebrew people, but rather it's to be a location, right, of which God is glorified through all the earth. Now, keeping that in mind, I want to fast forward to the book of Isaiah, right? And when we get to Isaiah, we're going to be in chapter 56, and I'm going to read for you verses 1 through 8. And trust me, all of this backstory is going to really play into what we're going to speak about today with the Passion Week. So if you want to read with me in chapter 56, and I'll read verses 1 through 8. And this is what Isaiah writes. This is what the Lord says, Preserve justice and do what is right, for my salvation is coming soon, and my righteousness will be revealed. Happy is the person who does this, the Son of Man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath without desecrating it, and keeps his hand from doing evil. 
no foreigner has joined himself to the Lord should say, The Lord will exclude me from his people, and the eunuch should not say, Look, I'm a dried up tree. For the Lord says this, For the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me and holds firmly to my covenant, I will give them in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give each of them an everlasting name that will never be cut off. As for the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord and minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to become his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and who hold firmly to my covenant, I will bring them to my holy mountain and let them rejoice in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be acceptable on my offer, on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayers for all the nations. This is the declaration of the Lord God who gathers the dispersed of Israel. I will gather to them still others besides those already gathered. Right, and so what Isaiah writes is essentially the same thing that Solomon prayed, right, is that the temple was to also be a place where foreigners could come, right? And that those foreigners who weren't ethnic Hebrew, who, who weren't Jewish people, that they would come and they would be given an everlasting name that would not be cut off, an everlasting relationship with the Lord, right? That his temple, right, would not be, once again, just a place of sacrifice for the Hebrew people, but his temple would be a place of worship and a house of of prayer, right? And so this is the this is the intention for the for the for the Hebrew people. This is the temp, the intention for the temple. But as we know, that that wasn't always the case. In fact, by the time that we make it to the prophet Jeremiah, we, we see that the Lord has an issue with His temple, and He has an issue with His people. And so, read with me in Jeremiah chapter seven, verses three through eleven, as we see this, verse three. It says, this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel says, correct your ways and I will allow you to live in this place. Do not trust deceitful words chanting, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Instead, if you really correct your ways and your actions, if you act justly towards one another, if you no longer oppress your resident alien, the fatherless and the widow, and no longer shed innocent blood in this place or follow other gods, bringing harm on yourselves, I will allow you to live in this place, the land that I gave to your ancestors long ago and forever. But look, you keep trusting in deceitful words that cannot help. Do you still murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and follow other gods that you have not known? Then do you come and stand before me in this house that bears my name and say, we are rescued. So we can continue doing all these detestable acts. Has this house, which bears my name, become a den of robbers in your view? Yes, I too have seen it. This is the Lord's declaration. And so what we see has happened is this, is that over time, right, the Hebrew people, though this temple was built, right, to be a testament to the one true God, though it was built to be a testament to his glory and to his faithfulness to his people, though, though it was built to be a light that, that, shone, that, that shone out the goodness and the glory of the Lord to all people all over the earth, right, what it had actually happened is it had become an idol. It had become something that the Hebrew people would look at and they would say, we can do whatever we want to because the Lord is with us. And how do we know that the Lord is with us? Because we have his temple, right? Did you see that? So this is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple. This was their attitude. Nothing bad can happen to us because we have the temple of the Lord. But what does God respond to them? He says, look, if you would just repent. He said, if you would correct your ways, if you would act justly towards one another, right? If you would treat each other the way that they should be treated, if you should look after the, the alien, the foreigner, if you would look after the orphan and the widow, right? Then I will protect you and you will stay in this land. But instead, you're going out and you're worshiping other gods and you're living in sin, right? And, and everything that you're doing is a desecration to me. And then you believe that you can come to the temple, and you can say, I'm at the temple. Everything's going to be fine now. And God says, because of your attitude and because of your actions, you've turned my temple into a den of thieves, into a den of robbers. He says, and I see that. 
Now, if you move a little bit further in your Bible, you've seen Ezekiel chapter 8 through 11, one of the saddest moments of the Old Testament, one of the saddest moments of the Bible. And in chapters 8 through 11, and I'm not going to reference them specifically for you, but what you see is you see the, the Spirit of the Lord grab the prophet Ezekiel and he takes him to Jerusalem and he takes him to the temple and he shows him all the profane acts that are happening in the temple. He shows them all the vain things, right, that God's people and his priest are doing, how they're worshiping other gods, how they've turned their back on the one true God. And then, right, as if that wasn't bad enough, right, you see this vision in Ezekiel where the Lord leaves the holiest of holies. He rises up and he leaves his temple. And the presence of God, right, that was established inside the temple, right, when Solomon built it and when Solomon dedicated it, leaves. But he doesn't just stop there. He goes out and he leaves Jerusalem. See, God isn't bound by a temple. God isn't bound by a city. Our Lord is the Lord of the universe, right? And, and the people could not just act what, however they wanted to act because he's a holy God. And he can't, he, can't, um, he can't interact with own holiness, right? That's, that's why we need salvation. It's why we need to be saved. It's why Jesus' blood needs to atone for us and why we're justified and why we're sanctified. But anyhow, God leaves his temple. And then as we move forward into the New Testament, we see that there's nowhere else in the Old Testament where it ever says that God comes back to the temple. Right? They, they, they come in from the exile, they rebuild the temple, but like I mentioned earlier, there's no Ark of the Covenant in the Holiest of Holies. Right? There's no mercy seat there where the Spirit of the Lord will, will reside. God never comes back into that temple until one day as a little boy, Jesus goes into the temple. And then another day as he's beginning in his ministry, he goes in in John chapter 2 and he disrupts the temple. And then in today's day of the Passion Week, Holy Monday, as they would call it. And if you'll read with me in Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 through 13, we see the third time that Jesus enters the temple here. And he's just come into the city the day before, right? It's been a big day of celebration. The people have yelled, they've screamed to him, save us, Jesus, save us, Lord, save us. He's, he's come in like, like a messianic king, right? Establishing his kingdom. And he goes to the, to the temple. And in verse 12, Jesus went into the temple and he threw out all of those buying and selling. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of thieves. And so as Jesus makes this declaration, what he does is he reminds them of the words of the prophet Isaiah, where he says that my intention was for this house to be a house of prayer for all peoples, for men and for women, right? For the Jew and for the Greek, for the Gentile, for everyone around this world. My house was to be a house of prayer. And, but then he reminds them of the words of Jeremiah, right? Right before the temple falls where God says, you've made my house a den of thieves. You've made it a den of robbers. You've been trusting in this house instead of loving me and following me with your actions and with your words, right? And with your deeds, right? In, in essence, what he had were, 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 there, were there things that they did, but he didn't have their heart. And his heart is what he wanted. And his heart is what he wants from us. He wants our heart. And so Jesus cleanses the temple, right? Essentially, he comes in and he says, look, this is supposed to be a house of worship, but instead you've made it into a county fair, right? You're just here and you're selling all these animals who are going to be used for the sacrifices instead of having it be a worshipful place. He says, my house is designed to be a light to the world, but instead you've built a fortress to keep yourself in and to keep everyone else out. And so he had to trust it. See, see, he had to change it because Jesus doesn't come into the city to leave things the way they are. Jesus comes into the city inaugurating a new kingdom, a new way that God is going to relate to his people. He's inaugurating, he says, this sacrificial system, it was just a shadow of things to come and those things to come are me. And by knowing me, the nations can know me and all who come to me and follow me will know their Lord and they can trust me for their salvation. 
And now, church, just one more passage, and I know that we've looked at a lot. If you'll turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 through 20, just as a way of application for us, as we look at it, as we've kind of followed the temple, we've seen the dedication, we've seen its purpose, we've seen what went wrong with the temple, we've seen Jesus come into the temple on the Holy Week, right? And, but where's the temple now? And let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 through 20 where he's writing to the Paul's writing to the believers in Corinth and he says don't you know that your body is a temple of the holy spirit who is in you whom you have from god and you are not on your own for you were bought at a price so glorify god with your body and so believer, fellow Christian, here's the deal. This temple is no longer around. It's no longer in Jerusalem. It's not there any longer. It's not this beacon of light calling the nations to the Father. But you and I and all believers around this world are temples, right? And the book of Matthew tells us that we're the light of the world, that a city on a hill cannot be hidden, right? That the world will look and they'll see our good works, and who will they praise? Not you, not me, but they'll praise our Father who is in heaven. And so today, where's the temple? It's the spirit that is residing within each and every one of us. And it is up to us to make sure that the people, that the person who we're promoting the most in this world, that the action that we're living the most is that of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and that the light within us is only a reflection of his light. And it's only because of his spirit that lives within us that we're able to project that light as his temple today. And so church, I'm looking forward to, to the rest of this week. And I pray that you'll just spend some time in contemplation, right? In thinking about this week that's known as Holy Week. And until we see each other again tomorrow, be blessed and be safe.